Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Rafael Pesturi. Am I, am I saying that correctly? Yes, yes. Yes, okay. So uh, this is an impressive guy. He has an MBA and engineering and physics diploma from Ecole Centrale Paris, a master's in statistics and a PhD in applied math from Harvard. He's now a postdoc in the MIT math department. Well before he finished his PhD, we started seeing his name headlining a string of highly influential metasurface optics papers coming out of uh, Capasso's lab at Harvard and Steve Johnson's lab at MIT. Uh, these papers were distinguished by the large role that innovative optimization strategies played in the design of the metasurfaces uh, from input output specifications, as is also known as inverse design. Recently, he's been looking at the joint design of metasurfaces and image processing algorithms by solving very high dimensional PDEs and the use of neural networks as surrogate functions in the solution of those PDEs. I think the form will be very interesting to neural researchers who are here, uh, who are here from the early days of computational photography. And I know the latter is interesting to neural folk who are currently looking at differential algebraic modeling and system design. So uh, please welcome Raphael. Raphael, it's all yours. Thank you for the great intro introduction uh, and for uh, inviting me to speak. Uh, and so today I'm going to present a uh, uh, my work done in collaborations with people at uh, MIT, Harvard, UW, and uh, IBM. And so I'm going to talk about extreme optics design as a large scale optimization problem. And of course, I'm going to define my terms a little bit later in the talk. Um, to give a little bit of motivation, um, I'm going to talk about uh, the metasurface design problem, and uh, at least the optics part of my talk. And uh, in contrast to traditional optics, which relies on uh, provocative properties of bulky curved lenses, um, uh, the metasurfaces um, rely on scattering properties of uh, devices that are thin compared to the wavelength, but very large in diameter, it can be uh, thousands of wavelengths. And um, they're aperiodically and uh, sub-wavelengths pattern uh, to uh, reflect or transmit light in a prescribed way. Um, and, and I want to uh, quickly uh, uh, talk about what I mean by uh, design. Um, so uh, in a metamaterial design problem, and, and I say in physics because I don't think it's like just about optics, um, you have um, basically the geometry, that's what you can control, uh, that's what you want to design. Uh, and um, you have uh, some uh, physical, really physical parameters that, that define that geometry uh, and with uh, some fabrication constraints and things like that. Uh, in the case of a, a metasurface, for example, the, the geometry are the choice of the sub-wavelength patterns that like uh, you have all around uh, in, the, in the metasurface. And then you also have a, a physical model. So it's a model that partially or fully describes the physics uh, of your problem. And that given uh, geometry will give you uh, the physical response. And usually you also have, when you're designing, you have a goal in mind. And the goal in mind is usually a property of this physical response. Um, you know, it might be uh, uh, for, a meta, for a meta lens, it would be focusing, but like for a meta surface, you could also try to bend light or uh, do some multiplexing. Uh, and I'm gonna also talk about like, uh, more complex kind of goals you might have in mind. And so there are like different schools of thoughts about designing. Uh, a very common one is uh, kind of intuitive design or also known as uh, forward design or heuristic based design or trial and error. Uh, and, and, and it's, um, you know, it's, 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 uh, it, it, it's starting with the physical model. It's trying to understand uh, what does it mean with respect to the physical model to have the goal that we have? And you spend a lot of time thinking, describing, modeling, uh, uh, modeling the physics, um, uh, and, and then you 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 build the geometry based on this intuition, and and then you test, right? So you have a model, you make some hypothesis, then like you have a resulting design, and then you test, and then you iterate like that. It's it's a little bit of trial and error. And um, for metasurface design, for example, uh, uh, a very common uh, uh, forward uh, design approach is the analytic approach. When, when you want to make a lens, 
uh, you kind of know what the field should uh, be like uh, kind of everywhere uh, around the focal spot. And so you can uh, constrain the field to be uh, something specific at the level of the metasurface. Uh, what the community does a lot is uh, to match a phase, to do phase matching with like the analytic phase that you want um, to have your, your application. And then the, the optimization from the design problem kind of uh, becomes, uh, you know, the, 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 a, a matching problem for each of your patterns independently. So they're not going to consider it like all together. You just have like your, your target phase at a given point and you, you try to match it like uh, locally uh, for that pattern specifically and you don't really care about the others. Um, now I showed the, uh, on top of this slide, um, this image uh, which shows like that like things go differently when you have a, a more complex objective, when like your objective is not just like for uh, one particular wavelength, for example, then you have multiple constraints for a single pattern. And so and it's harder to know, like when, once you've already like split your optimization problem into many independent pro uh, optimization problem, it's harder to know how to make compromises when you cannot exactly match what your goal should be. Um, and and it's so so that this, it, we're, we're we're starting to see kind of limitations of the forward design. It, it it you know it might it might be too crude. Like for example, here uh, the phase matching doesn't take into account constant amplitude. It uh, doesn't take uh, into account uh, varying amplitude. Um, but uh, it also is uh, from an optimization statement point. It's very constraining because you're not. Like maybe what you care about is just maximizing the intensity at a single point, but instead of that, you're constraining the, the field everywhere. Um, and also, uh, it, there's no, there's not this automatic uh, balancing uh, of trade-offs between the unit cells when you cannot really uh, 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 match your goal. Uh, there's no synergies within the unit cells. Like if you have uh, conflicting goals and you cannot do them uh, all together, it's hard to know. Like well, what is the best strategy? And there's no also uh, synergies between cells. Like you can say, well, uh, with this cell, uh, with this pattern, I ca it's called unit cells, cells and patterns, like the same thing. Uh, with this pattern, I'm gonna be very good with like this goal. And with this other pattern somewhere else, I will be very good with this goal. You cannot do this type of trade-offs uh, when you've already made the two, uh, pro the, the, when you've already split the optimization problem in many independent ones. Nonetheless, there is a lot of great work that's uh, done with the forward design approach and uh, already like uh, very large uh, meta surfaces have been designed and uh, successfully validated uh, in experiment. And, and, and uh, so here it's like some work from Harvard and some work from Caltech uh, for like some lens or uh, uh, even some uh, more complex like meta optics. Um, uh, but I want to talk about uh, another approach to design, uh, which instead of like, you know, spending a lot of time on the physical model uh, is really spending all the time on, on what we care about. And so it's inverse design, also known as large scale optimization. Why is it large scale optimization? Is because like now like you, you have what you care about, like you know your property um, and you want to optimize it directly. And now all your inputs uh, are uh, all your, your parameters for your geometry. So it's very large scale. Um, and what is nice about this paradigm of thinking is that it creates new research questions. Uh, and, and, and all those research questions are focusing on what we really care about, which is the goal property. So for example, it prompted me to develop new numerical methods to really be able to efficiently compute what I want uh, in a holistic approach. Uh, for example, to I'm going to present how to compute efficiently the far field of a meta surface, um, uh, which is often where the goal property that I would care about lies. And uh, and and as you can see already, like from this uh, uh, approach, then uh, well, it's not constrained by heuristics because you're not really doing the physical model uh, uh, in your in your mind anymore. And also, it's really using uh, state of the art computing techniques. Uh, it's really like taking advantage of you know uh, the 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 great advances that like software and hardware have been doing doing uh, uh, nowadays. Um, so it's really surfing that wave. Uh, and so. Um, 
when you uh, don't work too much on the on the uh, on the solver and you just use a brute force solver but do uh, inverse design, uh, you know there's already great work that has been doing uh, that has been done. I think those two examples come from uh, Stanford. Uh, this the on the left, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, sending different wavelengths to different angles. And it's like a periodic structure, and on the right, it's a multiplexer that sends different wavelengths to different channels. Um, and even for middle surface, actually, uh, inverse design with brute force uh, solver uh, has been uh, 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 worked on. This is uh, now my colleague at the time, he was uh, doing his PhD at Harvard. Uh, um, he, he, um, he, uh, Zilin, he created a meta surface, uh, and it's basically multiple layers uh, that have been designed for uh, the meta surface to concentrate light from multiple angles. Uh, it's a form of topology optimization, uh, and 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 now the uh, uh, topology optimization has done uh, more progress. You can do things that are much, much uh, uh, you know uh, fabrication ready, much more fabrication ready than that. But it, this this design is very limited. It's only twenty three wavelengths, and I told you like meta surfaces should be thousands of wavelengths. And so why is it not bigger? And how do you scale? And that's that's where you enter extreme optics. It's 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 actually very hard to uh, simulate a meta surface because they have those two length scales that are like very well illustrated on this image on the right. Um, you have the 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 large length scale, which is the large diameter, which can be up to thousands of wavelengths, and you have uh, a small length scale, which is like those sub wavelengths pattern and. And they are like orders of magnitudes apart. And that's why it's really hard to have the memory to resolve for the entire surface and also resolve for the small pattern, the small features. Um, and so it's a very challenging computing problem. So that's why uh, uh, it's, it's, it, if you want to use brute force to simulate a, a full meta surface, it's quickly a supercomputer scale type of problem. Um, and that's why I call it like extreme optics. Um, but we're not even like planning to just simulate a meta surface. We're not given one. We need to find one. So we need to search millions of parameters. Uh, and so this is the topic of inverse design photonics. Um, so the research question I want to talk about today uh, are um, how do you model uh, extreme optical devices? So a large area, but like very small features. Can you do that on a laptop? Um, how do you uh, design a device? Um, for complex opt optical or end-to-end -end functionalities. Uh, we're gonna touch upon that too. Uh, how do you uh, use uh, inverse design with incomplete knowledge of the desired solution? So say you don't wanna just do a lens or something and there's no, there's no uh, Maxwell solution that you know that would like, that you would want to match. How do you do? Um, during the optimization, how do you create synergies? across all your design parameters, because the idea is that like, if you can make uh, synergies, you can get more out of your parameters, right? So you can get, in the end, you can have better performance on your goal, which is what you care about. And if I have time or during questions, I also worked uh, over the past two years, mostly on uh, leveraging machine learning for, uh, me for meta surface and more generally for PD constraint design. Um, so this is the outline of my talk. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about the surrogate-based inverse design framework uh, for meta surfaces, and then I'm gonna talk about a, a few examples uh, that all use this surrogate-based inverse design framework. And I'm gonna explain why the surrogate base is important uh, and it still is now. And then uh, in the end of time permits, I'm gonna talk about uh, some uh, work I've done to use neural network of surrogate models or physics and deep uh, surrogates. Um, I see that like my title is has a repetition, but uh, so physics and enhanced neural network as surrogates, um, and so let's start with the with, with the this uh, this uh, surrogate based inverse design framework, which I published um, uh, in twenty eighteen in Optics Express, uh, and it basically has two components. Uh, it's for meta surfaces uh, or for this type of meta materials, anyways. Um, it's, it has a, a numerical approach to tackle uh, this extreme optics that I defined just before uh, with a hybrid solver. Uh, it has a surrogate model that handles the nan nanoscale and a convolution with an analytical Green's function to handle for the, the large scale. And, um, 
and, uh, and, and the second thing, the second very important uh, uh, point of that paper is to present the design problem. It's a, a design paradigm that I didn't invent, but it's just like for the metasurface problem, setting the metasurface design problem as a holistic large scale optimization problem. And so it all starts with uh, uh, an approximation, the local periodic approximation. Um, an approximation is that was done already by many authors uh, in the forward design scheme uh, in doing the phase matching techniques. And the idea is that um, to get an approximate version of the field above the middle surface by uh, breaking the large computational domain into, um, you can do that by breaking the large computational domain into subdomains. Um, because like if you zoom in, uh, so like in, uh, on that on that square red square, when you zoom in on patterns, uh, here the pattern is like a small disk, and you can see that its neighbors uh, are kind of similar. So the boundary conditions of this like subdomain simulation are taken periodic, um, and this approximation is actually surprisingly robust to uh, lack of periodicity. If you look at this. Uh, uh, close to those edges, right? Uh, that correspond to like Fresnel zones. Um, uh, it, it it actually change radius. Uh, the 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 disk change radius abruptly, right? It's like a three D design. It's a W, uh, and uh, uh, but uh, so it's quite robust. But it does break down when you have like uh, you know very oblique incident angles. Uh, and so quickly, like how how do you stitch everything together? Basically, you use this. Uh, a local periodic approximation, I'm probably going to say LPA in the future, uh, to simulate your meta surface by stitching uh, smaller simulations together. So, say you want to uh, simulate this meta surface on top that has, uh, you know, uh, patterns that are like those pillars with varying width. And so they are all different, the width, uh, but in order to get the field just above each pattern, you can use like periodic uh, uh, simulations. Um, to to uh, to to reconstruct like an approximate field based on, based on LPA, um, and then the 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 computational domain instead of being like this huge thing is like many many uh, very small domain like this that have periodic boundary conditions uh, where you have your pattern that has like varying width and you want to identify the field uh, on this dotted line. And then this field on this dotted line can be, uh, you can use a principle uh, of equivalence to transform it into sources and then convolve with a Green's function to approximate the field anywhere. So you can approximate the, the, rest, the physical response of your uh, very complex geometry of the meta surface. So with the LPS solution, we do a near to far field transformation also known as a, a principle of equivalence. And the basic uh, principle is that the near field stitched together uh, piecewise constant from LBA. Um, don't really need to be piecewise constant, but in the original paper, paper they were. Uh, and they can be seen as current fields that generate the, the field in the far field. And mathematically, um, starting on the right here, uh, we, we want to convolve like our near fields, uh, which is like those the, the results of all those small uh, simulations into equivalent currents. And so that's the principle of equivalence. And then we get the, we get the analytic grids function, which, which corresponds to those currents. And then we can evaluate the field anywhere in the far field. And so you use the, yeah, this is like a 2D, the 2D grids function that you would use uh, uh, in that case. And in 3D, you would use the, the analytic green functions that is appropriate. And <clears throat> note that like, it's a kind of technical uh, uh, aspect of it, that this support of the integral is infinite. Uh, but you can use a, a window function to, to make it tractable uh, computationally. Now, what I want to emphasize on is that like this approximate near field uh, 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 from uh, LPA, this is really like many, many uh, simulations of this like small domain with periodic boundary conditions where like at each positions on the meta surface, you look at like the parameterization of the pattern and that's the input of your simulation. And the output is the electric field, right? Um, and you have to do that millions of time. Um, although it's very tractable, like you need to do it many, many, many times uh, and repeatedly. It's, it's embarrassingly parallel uh, if you want to do it that way, but it takes a lot of time. So they're like, here you have two choices once you have this framework. You can either, uh, 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 let's start with the bottom, you can either decide to actually compute those with Maxwell's equation uh, 
um, uh, every time it's uh, like you know millions of times uh, of per 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 meta surface simulations. Uh, it the good thing is that it can be done like in parallel, so you can use like many CPUs like to do that work for you. And then like if you have a lot of resources, you can gain some time. Uh, and the main plus is that now you're no longer like limited to just having like a few parameters that like describe your geometry. You can like you can go crazy. You can have as many as you want because uh, I mean as many that would make sense. It's still like you know uh, if you're like very sub wavelengths, it might not really make sense to have like so many uh, uh, parameters. But like um, if you're not sub wavelengths, you can have like many parameters. Um, but like, you know, so it's an online Maxwell solver. It doesn't mean internet. It just means that you need a solver that you can query. Um, but I'm going to talk today about the, the surrogate model approach. And um, the surrogate model approach, uh, basically, what is a surrogate model? Uh, it is not a solver. So it's not a Maxwell's equation solver, but rather it's a learned model that fits a particular outcome of a simulation given parameters, OK? So you have parameters, and then you get your outcome. For example, for uh, these simulations here, uh, if you have a sub-wavelength uh, uh, subdomain, meaning that the period is sub-wavelength, and if you only care about the far field, the entire field uh, uh, here on this dotted line can be summarized by a single complex number, which is the complex transmission coefficient. If it's like, you know, if you have diffractive orders, then like you can use, you know, a little more point, a little more coefficients uh, to take into account the diffractive orders. But like basically, like you have, you can summarize the field with like a few numbers. And the surrogate model is fitted to Maxwell's equation solutions, like so, like where you actually compute for uh, simulations for like a, a given set of like input parameters, and like you see the output. But like it's it's fitting just like. To learn the complex transmission, right? To learn like those diffractive orders, and I'm, uh, to, like today I'm going to only present cases that are sub wavelength. So it's like just one one single uh, complex number, and and here the input, for example, is just like the width of that pillar, and so at evaluation time, the surrogate model just see, sees the width, and it gives you it evaluates the model. Uh, and gives you whatever it learned, right? And in, in that case, it's the complex transmission. But it doesn't have uh, the, 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 equax, the the Maxwell's equation in it, right? It, it's just, and, and that's why it's very fast. It doesn't really solve for the fields. It doesn't field, solve for the fields everywhere. It just evaluates a surrogate model. And so that's the reason why a surrogate model is much, much faster than uh, solving for uh, uh, Maxwell's equation every time. And, 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 and this thing, uh, that, that's why today I'm only presenting about surrogate based, is that um, that gains you like about five to six order of magnitude in speed. And so that, that, that's what makes the, the, the method like uh, really powerful, I think. Um, in the original paper from 2018, like I used the Chebyshev polynomials as surrogates. Uh, Chebyshev polynomials are great because they are exponentially convergent for smooth function. Uh, and it requires less expensive Maxwell solves to train. Okay, um, unfortunately for uh, you know for a, a, a polynomial of degree n in each direction, you would need n plus one points in each direction. So it means that if you have like p parameters to describe your your pattern uh, as input of your surrogate model, then you need n plus one to the power of p points. Uh, to train your surrogate model to fit it, right? And, and so this number of points needed uh, quickly becomes intractable as the number of param parameters increase. And this is called the curse of dimensionality. So technically, sur uh, Chebyshev surrogate models are, are, are really, really uh, tractable and useful for like, up to three, four parameters. But like once you have more, you're starting to run into issues like training your surrogate model takes too long. Um, so you have diminishing return. Um, and here, the two images that I'm showing are uh, show how, uh, how important the choice of point is. Um, the strength of uh, Chebyshev interpolation comes from the combination of both the polynomials and their uh, special sets of training points, the Chebyshev points. Uh, for the same function, one uh, uses uh, uh, on the left Chebyshev points and on the right, uh, equally spaced points to try to fit the function. And you can see that on the right side, you, you have a very big artificial oscillations called the Runge phenomenon. And it shows that like basically with this model, if I was using this surrogate model, 
uh, a lot of like the the output it would give me would be garbage, and basically my whole simulation would be garbage. The, uh, an accurate surrogate model is pretty important. So now that I introduced you know the the two different scales of uh, the hybrid solver, uh, this is uh, a simulation for a lens with uh, 20 wavelength that is 20 wavelengths long. It's in 2D and it's composed of uh, 40 unit cells. And uh, I compare here the the approximate solver uh, called green solver that I introduced and a brute force solver. And uh, the the simulation is rather small so that we can keep the the brute force solver uh, you know uh, fast enough. Um, and so the approximate solver is, uh, we can see on the right, like there are like different sections uh, to compare the two, the two solvers. Like it's plenty accurate enough for optimization, especially where we care about, which is like here it's a lens and it's at the focal lens. Um, and since the fabrication error anyways, is in like the percent, you know, uh, percent range, like a few percent accuracy is plenty enough for, for a solver used in optimization. And the main punchline here is that like the solver on the left is uh, a five orders of magnitude faster than the solver on the right. Uh, before I move on to like uh, setting the uh, metasurface meta design problem as uh, an optimization problem, I want to uh, talk a little bit about other approaches uh, to solving metasurfaces. And I'm gonna come back to it also even later uh, to compare uh, now uh, how, uh, how they compare numerically. Um, so uh, LPA, uh, as I said, has limits, uh, especially at very oblique angles. We have a, a paper from 2018 as well that did it. Um, it's for uh, the lo locally uniform approximation, but you can see that like even for locally uniform approximation, you, you have uh, a, a poor performance at very oblique ang angles. And, um, in the in the context of phase matching, there is some work that has been done uh, by uh, the Conte group uh, that was like uh, computing like corrections and by by simulating like not only the pattern but also its neighbors and then retrieving the phase and that was like a little more accurate than LPA. And there is uh, there are other uh, decomposition methods uh, or, uh, other than uh, uh, the local periodic approximation. And uh, the overlapping domain is actually quite quite similar to this local phase method from the Conte group, where uh, basically, you know, in, in order to get, get the field, not just the phase, uh, uh, you want to simulate not only uh, the, the 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 pattern of interest, but also a little bit of its neighbors. Uh, so that was done in the context of topology optimization. Uh, so when when you when you you know solve online. Uh, when you, you can query your, your solver and like adding a little bit of the neighbors like help to really uh, be more accurate. So that so if you can afford to have more parameters and include the neighbors, you can have something that is more, uh, it, it costs more because like you have much more parameters, but you can be more accurate. Another thing is like when you have wider unit cells, so not sub wavelengths, uh, then you can use like just PML instead of periodic boundary conditions. Um, but it, it's good for when you have like wider, uh, wider unit cells like that, you know, that they have like their own like uh, uh, modes that like uh, expand, you know, that, that can be like in a way like a bit non-local, right? Like they can, they can be expanding a little bit. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and so that, that's another option. But again, like if you wanted to do that with a surrogate based approach, like you would need a lot more parameters because now uh, you want to be uh, to you want you want to have larger unit cells, and also I want to mention that like brute force solvers also are making uh, a tremendous uh, progress. Uh, they are like uh, GPU accelerated FDTD uh, from um, uh, Stanford, um, where like they really like boost uh, 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 traditional FDTD solvers to like be pretty fast and. Uh, this other paper by Vukovic's group, like where they use transition matrix method to, you know, th those are accurate methods uh, uh, and they're like faster than FDTD. Um, so uh, now that we have the solver, um, we want to be able to design a meta surface. Um, and so designing, uh, oh, I see I got a question. Um, so basically each PML is modeled as a phase shift plus attenuation. Um, I, I'm not sure I understand the question, but we can maybe go, get back to questions uh, after the talk, uh, but uh, I'd love to discuss more about it. Um, 
uh, the the so the, when once you have your pass solver, like you want to uh, solve your design problem as a large scale optimization problem, and that's just this formulation. Here you want to find the geometry that is parameterized by the the optimal parameter that you're going to find p that will maximize uh, the objective function of your field. And here the field can be computed very fast uh, using LPA. Uh, and a surrogate model, and then like a transformation to the far field. And note that like just by writing the problem like that, uh, you've already won uh, because uh, you already are like coupling your optimization of all the parameters together. Uh, and so here are like example functions for lens just like to, to make things more concrete. Uh, and to also illustrate something. Uh, if you want to design lens, that, yeah, you know, like the, the foreign methods would like constrain the field everywhere, right? And so we, you can also do that, basically. You, you can also decide to do that. And then it's just an integral of like your target field with like the, the field that is actually there. And, and this formulation has also the benefit of taking into account the, 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 the amplitude as well. Uh, but another way that is less constraining of the, uh, 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 and uh, so it's like a, a less constraining formulation uh, that usually would give more better performance when you have like complex design is to just like uh, uh, constrain the field where you care about. So for example, a lens is maximizing the intensity at the focal spot. So why don't we just compute the field at the focal spot and try to maximize it? That's this, that's this idea. Uh, and, and it's large scale optimization. You're maximizing uh, over the whole geometry at once. So in 2D, you can have a uh, hundred parameters, but I'm going to show an example with uh, a billion parameters, for example. And so when you have a billion parameters, there's no uh, other methods uh, that gets to uh, local optimum in a reasonable time uh, than um, uh, gradient-based optimization. Fortunately, when you have a linear problem uh, and, and you have like many, many, many inputs, but you have just a single output that you care about, then you can get you can use the adjoint method to get all your gradients that you need uh, with a single simulation. So if you have like many many inputs and a, a very few outputs, use the adjoint method to get your gradient. If you have very few inputs but many many outputs, then you want to use more of a forward method. Uh, but you can basically get if you have a single objective, you can get all your uh, all your, der your partial derivative derivative at once uh, with the cost of a single function evaluation. It's just a, a single linear solve. And um, then once you have your function evaluation and your gradient, you can use you know, any state of the art of the shelf uh, uh, gradient-based optimization algorithm. I like to use uh, uh, the CCSA, con uh, conservative convex separable approximation agor algorithm because it handles uh, general nonlinear constraints. Um, and, and then a note on like complex meta optics optimization. So, you know, I, I mentioned, you know, sometimes for a single uh, pattern, you have like conflicting goals, right? Like you have multiple goals at once. You want to, uh, you want the meta, you want your meta surface to be focusing uh, multiple different uh, wavelengths on the same point, or like to be focusing different wavelengths on different points. Uh, but, but you have like many, many, uh, 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 goals that are like competing with each other. And uh, often what we want to do is a worst case optimization. Uh, uh, the worst case optimization usually end up with uh, um, uh, performances that are like uh, similar uh, across all your targets and you're not like leaving one out. And so what is the, the what does the optimization problem look like then? You try to find the uh, parameters that define a geometry that will maximize the minimum performance of your goal. So for example, here it's the minimum intensity at the focal spot uh, for a bandwidth of, uh, uh, for, for like a discrete wavelengths uh, in a bandwidth. Um, the problem is that this formulation is not differentiable because the minimum uh, is not differentiable at crossing points. Uh, but you can use, for example, uh, the epigraph form, which basically puts all your targets as nonlinear constraints. Just to wrap up on the uh, surrogate-based optimization uh, uh, um, a framework um, and comparing forward design and inverse design, like we said that there were a few limitations in the forward design. Uh, for example, there was no compromise between unit cells uh, because they are independently optimized. And we saw that like with inverse design, you can automatically balance all the trade-offs that you need across the unit cells. 
Um, we also said that like when you have like competing goals, there's no obvious compromise within the unit cell uh, uh, with the forward method. And, and, and again, with the inverse design, you just like, it's a, it's a holistic approach. So like it's, it's taking into account like all those different constraints and, and also like uh, all the different unit cells all together. Um, we said that like for the forward design, you often need like to know what your target solution is. And in inverse design, you're doing already like a PDE constraints optimization. So you know that your solution will be a solution to Maxwell's equation, but you might not know which one and you can discover it and find the one that best fit your goal. And in the end, like it's more about like setting up, uh, it's more like um, the philosophy of setting up an optimization problem. You want to be the the you, you want to be constraining the list and really focusing on what you care about. And so you know the forward approach of constraining the field everywhere uh, is maybe not as uh, uh, is is not as well suited to an optimization as like just uh, optimizing for like the target only. And that's more about like optimization design, like the, the formulation. Now I'm gonna discuss about a few uh, 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 examples that were like fabricated and realized and that worked well, and that was exciting. Um, so uh, this is examples for a lens with extended depth of field. Um, for those unfam unfamiliar with the uh, extended depth of field, these lenses will be in focus on a longer range than like traditional lenses. So a different depth, uh, you will still be in focus, uh, and uh, because they and and so the technically what they what they do is that instead of focusing on a focal spot, they kind of like focus on a segment in depth, uh, and like there was previous work on this, like using cubic cubic phase mass and logosphere uh, lenses, but they both had like their 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 limits, uh, and so we can uh, try to set up. Uh, an optimization problem uh, that uh, optimizes for like this like segment to have high intensity. Uh, and basically that what it's doing is that it's finding the set of optimal parameters that define a geometry that would maximize the minimum int intensity on that segment. Uh, and note that like uh, for that type of lens, like there's no, uh, there's no Maxwell solution that we know uh, a priori, right? Uh, so, so your design is going to find a, a solution to Maxwell's equation that fits your, your that fits your need the best. Here, the unit cell uh, that uh, was uh, used. Uh, so, this is a cylindrical lens. Uh, so, the the design was done with a, a 2D uh, simulation, and here the pattern is a pillar of uh, silicon nitride on true silica with varying width. Um, and uh, we optimize for a lens with a diameter of 56 microns and with uh, 150 parameters to increase the depth of field. And you can see uh, the image of the lens here and uh, theory computations and the experiment uh, match very well. And, and we showed like uh, that the depth of focus was increased by three for this like 633 nanometer uh, wavelength. And we also did uh, uh, these two examples are lenses with extended depth of field, but this time in 3D and it was published with a, a this previous work was done uh, in uh, published in uh, SES Photonics and this was published in uh, uh, Nanophotonics also with uh, my collaborator at uh, UW. Forgot to mention the, the guy on the top right is Alka Majumdar, my collaborator at UW. Uh, and Elias Bayad, he is a student I'm working with. Uh, and uh, in this work, the lenses were designed in, uh, for like 3D and it was more difficult on the solver side. Uh, uh, and in contrast to a cylindrical lens, it can also be used for imaging. Um, and and uh, what we were very happy about it, so it's the same optimization problem. We were quite happy about the fact that we got a 47% efficiency, uh, which was comparable to like what a single wavelength beta lens would do. Uh, and we see two example realization, one with a hundred uh, micron diameter and the other one, one millimeter diameter. It starts to be big for a meter surface. Uh, and they both present a, a significant enhancement in the depth of field. And a side benefit of a 3D lens with extended depth of field is that we can use it for broadband imaging. And this is broadband imaging with a meter surface that has like 47% uh, efficiency. So that, that's kind of cool. Here we, you can see the, um, Imaging results of a checker pattern and uh, MIT, you are welcome here logo. Uh, and um, you can see that traditional lenses have a, a very pronounced chromatic aberration, especially for green 
uh, and the lens with extended depth of uh, field uh, does not show as much uh, aberration. And uh, you can further improve the result with like some computational backend. Um, now I'm gonna mention a work on a very large polychromatic lenses that has been done with Harvard uh, at the Capasso Lab. And this is the postdoc Jerry Lee I worked with uh, uh, closely for uh, uh, multiple years. Um, and so uh, here we, we did a, a lens that is polarization sensitive and has very big diameter. It's like the biggest meta surface to date, like 20,000 uh, wavelength uh, diameter. Um, and so uh, pr previous work uh, for achromatic meta lens was done for like, you know, a smaller diameters because uh, like about 50 micron, maybe a little more, but it's still like, you know, 200 uh, uh, times smaller in diameter and like uh, 40,000 times smaller in, uh, in area. Um, and the design uh, with an analytic approach here is it, very hard as the, basically as the, the uh, as the, the diameter increases, it gets harder and harder. Um, and here again, we set the problem as a, a, an optimization, a large scale optimization problem where you want to find the, the parameters that define the geometry. And here we're talking about like a billion parameters um, that will uh, maximize the minimum intensity at the, at the focal spot. Like here we wanted to correct for a chromatic aberration for uh, a discrete set of uh, wavelengths. And this is what the uh, unit cell looks like. It's a top view. And another thing that we did for that, uh, and that was a huge co computational saving, uh, was that you can uh, optimize a rotationally invariant parameter function, uh, thus making the computational cost proportional to the diameter of the metasurface rather than its area. And note that it's, it's really a benefit of surrogate-based approach because the actual structure then is sampled from the parameter function, but it itself is not rotationally invariant. So, so it's, it's a, really a benefit from the surrogate-based approach. And, um, <clears throat> and we designed a two millimeter diameter lens for six wavelengths. Um, it, yeah, you won't be able to read, but it's like across the visible uh, from uh, 490 nanometers to 650 nanometers. And we can see that the focal uh, spot knows, shows no chromatic aberration and uh, uh, for the six wavelengths and uh, the focal spots were uh, diffraction, diffraction limited for uh, the two uh, numerical apertures of interest, like uh, we had two different designs. Uh, and we also did the one centimeter diameter uh, lens uh, achromatic for a uh, red, green, blue. Uh, here, the, so the design is so big that you can actually see it uh, with your own eye. Like it's just a, a regular picture. It's not an SEN uh, picture. Um, and uh, we can see that um, the, the chromatic aberration is like a few micron. But keep in mind that the focal lens is like 1.5 centimeters. So it's actually uh, a 0.03% uh, aberration. And uh, it was successfully used for imaging too. Um, so that, that's, that's actually a, a very exciting uh, 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 application. And here I wanted to come back on like the different methods we could have used maybe uh, uh, to do this method and see like if we could not do like avoid the surrogate based approach. And the answer is like right now, not really. Because even though other techniques are making great progress in the matter of uh, simulation of meta surface, um, the, the, the LPA uh, surrogate based solver is still like the fastest by orders of magnitude. So here, basically, I, I uh, did uh, a benchmark and I did the generous uh, assumption of linear scaling with the area um, uh, uh, in, and the area in, in number of wavelengths, uh, of course. And, and so you can see that the transition matrix method is, is more accurate and it's faster than like brute force, but it, it it's still a billion times small, slower. So it would take like 20, 29 years to compute like uh, the one centimeter meta surface, just like one, right? Like not optimizing it. Uh, and the GPU accelerated uh, is like about, you know, 10 million times slower. Uh, it would take about 4.5 months to simulate a single one. If you use like large, large area topology optimization, so you have an online solver, you don't use a surrogate based approach. And this was nice also because it's assuming that you can do some, some, uh, some uh, uh, cylindrical, uh, uh, you know, ro rotationally in invariant type of structure, uh, but then it limits your degrees of freedom. It, it would still be, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, hundred thousand times uh, slower 
And so really here, what the, the, you, you kind of have to use a surrogate based solver. That's the reason why it's because the surrogate based, the surrogate gets you so much. It gets you like the, the, the five or six order of magnitudes that you need to make the, the design tractable. So, um, so Rafael, a quick question. If you were to incorporate the time it took to get the data to fit your surrogate function, yeah yeah that's, what that's, those times look like that is that is a very good question actually i could maybe it depends on the number of parameters that are in right so if your surrogate model has like 20 parameters well then like the training time outweighs uh you know the the benefits of the surrogate approach i mean depending on how many times you plan to reuse it um actually so my next slide was about like recent end-to-end -end, uh, work that, that we've done. But um, something that would answer your question more directly is like my recent uh, scientific machine learning work on surrogate models, which like really is at the core of your question of like, well, that's great. Like surrogate models evaluate very fast, but you pay the cost up front. And so like, you know, how, how can you make a surrogate approach viable if you want more parameters? So that's, that's been like a, the core of my research uh, over the last two years. So if you want, I could, I could, I, I could skip directly to a neural network, uh, to my, my scientific machine learning work. Is that, it's, is that okay with you? Yeah, I'd say you have about thir uh, 13 minutes to go. So it's your, your judgment call, but maybe we'll go straight to neural network and then yeah. come back to end to end if we have time. Yeah, exactly. So that's like some end to end work that I'm not going to present today. Uh, but this this latest work, uh, just saying that like the, you know, the, the reason we can do something that is fabricated and that is currently being experimented um, is like, again, like we, we had to use a, a surrogate based approach because that's how you get to a, a, a design in a reasonable amount of time today, right? Like we're making progress, but right now surrogate base is still a winner. Um, and so the question is, okay, uh, I, I, you know, I've been all about surrogate, surrogate models. And I told you like, oh, it's so fast, but that's true. Like it's so fast at evaluation time, but uh, we already talked about the curse of dimensionality for Chebyshev interpolation. Like there is a trade-off of like training time like the cost at the training time and the benefit at evaluation time. And so I wanna introduce uh, neural networks, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Uh, basically neural networks are now very popular. It's an algorithm with uh, millions of parameters, which uh, it's, it's nonlinear, it takes inputs, uh, then does a bunch of matrix multiplication composed with like nonlinear activation functions on multiple layers. Uh, and like how you do your multiplication varies in function of the architecture. And then, um, and then you also have a nonlinear yeah, activation function and you do that over many layers and, um, and, and you can use that as, uh, as your surrogate model. And I, I don't think we understand very, very well why it works, but it has like a lot of practical successes. Um, and it's also known to alleviate the curse of dimensionality, which I told you like, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, just four parameters to describe your, your, your pattern just doesn't cut it. So what do you do then? Uh, well, if you if you need more, that that's the that's the that's what I've been uh, exploring. Just a quick word of caution, you know, in uh, using neural networks for like physical design. Uh, like I, I put a picture of uh, a Frenchman. I'm French too, so I'm quite a chauvinistic. Uh, uh, and 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 uh, and uh, Scott's uh, 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 Maxwell. Uh, they worked really hard to have like a very good physical model, right, of, of Maxwell's equation that is actually very good. So if you come with a neural network um, and it's a black box model, like it's going to be hard to compete uh, with this great optics. So it, you know, if you if you plan to do some physics a lot a lot of time, like you might as well use like you know the physics the physics that we already figured out. Um, it's just difficult to compete. Like if you want to recognize faces, that's a different story. The, like the, the model is more difficult. Um, but there's a very compelling advantage of using neural networks uh, as surrogate models. Uh, one, uh, when when the basically when when the the benefit of the evaluation time will outweigh the training costs, and it's when like 
you're trying you're reusing something many many times so you know like uh, in the surrogate model i was telling you, you you use it like a billion times for a single uh, meta surface evaluation if you do more than one one uh, meta surface evaluation because you do a design like very quickly you reuse it many times and so you you get you get the return on the uh, on the training uh, it's hard to it, it would be hard to really put a number on it because it depends on the parameters that you use uh, and also, uh, you know, uh, why a neural network? Well, because it does it, it does a better actually when when you have many parameters, it does better than interpolation and other you know traditional uh, surrogate model that you could think of. Uh, and so the training problem is really the main problem, right? Like it, it's a trade off between accuracy and you need accuracy because otherwise your whole model is garbage. But you know you also want to not spend too much time training. And so a first, uh, a first uh, uh, direction that I worked on was to try to use feedback from your model that is learning to uh, get to, to know where to, uh, to explore next. That's what I've been working with, with Yusef Fouet from uh, IBM. It's called active learning. And so um, actively uh, uh, learn neural networks um, you know, for, for example, this is for a model where instead of like one or four parameters, I have like 10 parameters. This is like maybe not the most realistic model for like an LPA approach, but like it's like you have like 10 layers, right? And they all have like varying width. Those are your 10 parameters. Uh, like you have like holes inside a substrate. Uh, it's not the most fabricable, it's not the most relevant for LPA, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's what I've been using to, you know, have something where I can change the number of parameters easily. Um, and so uh, you can see already when uh, you're using Chebyshev interpolation uh, versus a uh, neural network for the to to for uh, for for the surrogate model, you, you your baseline a neural network is already more efficient for the number of points. Now Chebyshev interpolation, like um, it, it suffers the it, it is exponentially convergent. For smooth function, but it suffers the, the the curse of dimensionality, and so it's in a regime where it does really poorly. Uh, uh, radial basis function also does poorly there. Um, and then the question is like, when you have neural networks, how do you try? How do you get better value out of your simulations, which is really what is costly when you train. Uh, and so this active learning algorithm is basically uh, using your model as it's learning to explore next, and it's using a, a is basically the way it explores is like instead of sampling points randomly, it selects points that are like the best, the biggest estimated error, and you get like already a, a for a given accuracy that you need, you 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 get like an order of magnitude saving in uh, the in the creation of you know new data. So that was that was quite exciting. Um, now I told you that like you know it's too bad you have a neural network. Um, and, and, and uh, it's hard to compete with Max's equation with a neural network. And so the, my latest work is, is the idea to, uh, you, you know, to have like a physics enhanced deep surrogate. So I call it, we call it PEDS and it's combining a neural network generator with a low fidelity model. So in itself, the low fidelity model is very inaccurate and usable for design. Um, but it contains knowledge of the physics. It has Maxwell's equation in it. Uh, it, it has the same conservation laws, uh, so it has knowledge, um, and 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 we train this model like this thing is like basically you have the input like it, the, uh, with with a, an online solver you just would you have your input your your geometry you have your solver that is accurate and then you get the complex transmission uh, computed from the fields right uh, in the physics and hence deep surrogate you basically combine it like with uh, you you have a uh, you have a neural network generator that will create another input for a low fidelity model so basically the idea is that like you're going to create another input but the solution of that solve which is very fast because like it's a very inaccurate model that is like very fast to compute will be the same complex transmission, right? It's a surrogate model. So you don't need to have the fields everywhere to be correct. You just need the, the single complex number and that's why it works. Um, and so you and so uh, even though now you're including a solver, so instead it's like still a hundred times slower than interpolation, but it's still 10,000 times faster than a solving for a Maxwell's equation on nine, right? So it's kind of like a trade-off. Um, 
and so uh, and, and and it's a trade-off we would be willing to do uh, in order if if it can save us a lot at the training time, and it does. Like um, so, this is this is like the accuracy of like a pet solver that is like combined with active learning, um, and you can see that um, for this ten parameter structure is the same one. Uh, in the low data regime, when you have like less than a thousand, uh, you, you, you're like three times more accurate than like a neural network baseline. Uh, but it also seems to converge faster. Like it seems to have like a better, uh, a better uh, uh, you know, uh, return for your extra simulations as like your number of simulation increases compared to neural network. And you can get to like, you know, a few percent errors uh, within like a reasonable number of simulation for 10 parameters. So that's like very exciting. And, and the reason why I'm very excited about that and I put a lot of work in this type of surrogates is that, you know, here on the left is a toy example with like a unit cell that has 10 parameters and you can then do some optical design. This is really opening many doors. As I said, you know, LPA it has its limits, but if you want to go uh, beyond LPA, you need to be able to feed more parameters. Uh, and so, if you and so uh, having more parameters per uh, per uh, 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 for your uh, surrogate model really will enable you like more complex scattering and improved performances. Um, for example, like uh, you know, you could consider like more complex unit cells, like a little deeper, uh, uh, like this one, maybe not as deep, but uh, uh, you could consider wider unit cells, as I was mentioning. Uh, from this uh, 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 other decomposition method from uh, Jonathan Fan. And uh, you could also use uh, uh, more accurate technique like the domain decomposition techniques uh, uh, of overlapping domain. Uh, and, and basically you enable also richer scattering when you're like, not just saying like, oh, I have sub wavelengths uh, unit cells, like, but I have like bigger unit cells that like enable like, you know, more, compli more complicated modes that will like result in like, you know, better performances. Uh, just to finish my talk, uh, uh, we didn't talk uh, really the, at, about the end-to-end -end optimization, but basically what we're at is that we have a, a, an end-to-end -end optimization where we optimize both the, the meta surface or the, the scatter structure and the post processing, but there's not many parameters in post processing. I think there is a way to like do some end-to-end -end optimization with, with like post processing that is more like neural network based, and and I think it would be uh, by starting with like thinking about like better priors, like neural priors. Um, so that's something I'm working on currently. Uh, another thing is, um, you know, I really want to increase uh, the surrogate-based uh, inverse design uh, capabilities by now using more uh, this uh, uh, neural surrogates that I've developed like in the context of uh, uh, designing uh, applications. And to finish, um, I think we really found something very interesting with this uh, uh, scientific machine learning approach of combining uh, uh, you know, a, a neural network and, uh, and a low fidelity model. And so I've been, I've been working on like uh, this type of stuff, but uh, with like other physics like um, you know, heat equation or things like that. Um, so with that, um, I thank you for uh, your attention and uh, I, I'm happy to answer questions.